Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations, a weekly podcast from Practical E-Commerce, hosted by entrepreneur Eric Bandholz. What is going on, Internet? Eric Bandholz back again with another E-Commerce Conversations. Hope all is going well on the other side of the Internet. On the other side of the table from me, I got uh, Will, Mike, and Mark. What's Ooh. happening? Howdy, Welcome. howdy. Hola. We're excited. We're here in National park of zion zion national park it's uh late at night we're actually in the quiet hour so we're uh talking nice and quiet as to not get warned to uh which has happened in... yeah which has happened before we're uh with a group of guys how many guys are here 13 14 14 14, 14 yeah. it was 15 watchman campground here at zion what the heck are we doing here well i'll uh, i'll jump in on that one real quick so mark Started this tradition with me a few years ago where uh, we go to national parks and we, we spend uh, some time getting out in nature. And in the last year, he asked me where I wanted to go next. And we had a discussion, mentioned Zion, Zion National Park. And unbeknownst were to Were you me, like, I got an eye on Zion? <laughs> For the listeners, this is that's what we've stretching. been dealing with all That's week. a stretch one on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's not your best. That's not, my not best. your best. Uh, okay, best. I got better. You just lost half your audience. But uh, the only spot that was available... Yeah, it was uh, one of the group sites at uh, Zion National Park, and there was basically, you know, it was rated for up to 30 people, and uh, three contiguous days in the middle of the week, and uh, booked it with, uh, you know, one other confirmed. And so I get this text from Mark that says, hey, we uh, we need 15 minimum people, when it was just supposed to be a couple of guys, and I said, uh, I understand the assignment. And this kind of just developed from there. Yeah, started reaching out to all the interesting people who were wild enough to take a a week off and <laughs> had to Zion. And then once he was out of that, I got an invite. So I feel really grateful to be here. <laughs> we that, was, that was the last invite. It was <laughs> yeah. actually like yesterday. I just Who got this invite. Know? They're like, oh, we got to hit that number. We had some cancellations. So I'm glad to see you guys. Yeah. So what is the purpose of having an event like this? Like why get a bunch of guys together who are kind of like business people? I mean, probably more serious than what the tone of the podcast typically is. But in this case, you know, for me, I had some friends who were talking about like men getting together, kind of men's group and that kind of thing. And I'd only ever heard that in a church setting. And I was like, well, I mean, this isn't a guy's trip where we're going to Vegas and everybody's getting lit for a few days. This is actually us going out, spending time, chatting with one another, bouncing ideas off each other. There's also a lot of shit talking going on. Let's oh, be real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of shit talking. But anyway, you know, so I said, hey, let's call it a men's trip. And that's what it is. I feel like I've done a few of these over the years. In fact, Mike and I, I think that's where we met was, uh, or at least you think that's where we met. That's a hundred percent where we met. Okay. Yeah. So how do you know Billy then? Because uh, we another, met at another an men's group. A, yeah. uh, I, I have met almost all of my entrepreneurs, all the major things that I've learned have been in retreats with other really smart guys and I've just got to slowly level up through osmosis. How do you think you get invited to these things? Like, what is that chance? Is it hey, just... Well, in my case, uh, cancellations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my strategy for networking has always been, how can I make myself the most interesting person I could possibly be and then share that story? And that usually seems to work and people just keep inviting me to things and then I get more interesting and then it's just a growth thing. I, I feel like as long as you're doing something cool, then you get to be around people who are doing cool things. I feel like one of the keys in life is also being willing to say yes more often. I know like in the business circle, they always talk about saying no and your time is worth this and that and, you know, be on your schedule. But how much of you guys have a like a yes mindset of just like, Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I say yes to anything fun. For me, this is the only reason to be doing this stuff. This is a priceless thing. Not just, I don't think of it as an ROI on time, but like this is the goal is to go do fun things with people I'm inspired by, right? So 
but it also happens to be, you know, a huge ROI every time. I kind of want to jump in here and say, I mean, look, there, there is, I think, one of the things that's unique about this group is that we all have the capacity to operate and to pontificate at a certain level. We can find the deeper meaning to things, but at the same time, uh, and, and actually, I think because of that, I've noticed with this group, it allows us to kind of cut loose. And in our day-to-day lives, we don't have that ability. We're fathers, we're husbands, we're you know boyfriends, we're leaders at our at companies. The subtleties of the way we interact have these ramification effects on the people around us. And so, like for instance, I can just speak for myself. This week, like I said, a, <laughs> I said a lot of things that I wouldn't want recorded. This is the only time we've been recorded. This is the only time, <laughs> yeah. thankfully. Yeah. And that uh, we're aware of. That we're aware of. <laughs> and you know, it's there's this aspect of being able to bring humor back in to have levity and to be able to literally, I, mean, I mentioned earlier, but just shoot the shit with a bunch of guys that are also at your level. And then in between those moments, you know, in between the hikes, in between the cutting up, there are these deeper connections, these conversations that come up naturally and organically. And we've kind of created this space for that to happen. Yeah, you really can't be yourself unless you're around peers, right? Yes. Because yeah. there's jealousy, there's insecurities, and the, all those things still exist. But it's an opportunity to be vulnerable with people who are going through the same stuff, and, you know, and just not worry about judgment. One of the things about Zion is this is I'm not a campion expert, but this is the bougiest campsite I've ever been. There are literally like spas right across the river. Everyone's got internet. You know, one of the things that I've admired about you, Will, is like your dedication to disconnecting. And putting the phone away. I think you left it in Denver or something like that. You know, how do you find that balance between being able to disconnect from the craziness of what's going on back at work or at home and being able to be present in the moment at the campsite? Um, it's something that's, I guess, a privilege of, of achieved at this point. I think that if, if people are starting businesses, there's a phase where you, that's probably not possible. I mean, there is this phase of the manic, you know, 20 hour days where you're building, but part of the goal of entrepreneurship is to be able to build those systems that enable other people to start taking the torch from you in different areas. And so that's kind of the, you know, the groundwork for even that to be possible. But the other aspect of it too, for me personally, is just realizing that I had gotten so disconnected from my body, from my emotions and from a lot of relationships because of the effort to level up and to build something from a financial perspective. And so I'm on this journey, so to speak, to become a human again. You know, and this is everything from being aware of what I'm eating to what I'm feeling and realizing that, you know, look, we, humans did not evolve to have our dopamine hijacked by these devices. And, you know, there's a difference between reading a newspaper and then context switching to talk to your friend versus having a little box which physically narrows the focus of your gaze and can feed you unlimited context switches. And so part of that for me is realizing that, that was really affecting my outlook on life and my enjoyment. And so there's this piece of looking back at what actually generates fulfillment and and meaning and depth. And Mark it, generates fulfillment. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect is timing. That, that Perfect timing. <laughs> that was a good delivery. And uh, and yeah, and it, and it comes back to always comes back to people. It always comes yeah. back to people. It always comes back to your family and your friends. Mike, you're in the early days still of, of momentum. Like you don't have that same kind of luxury, do you? No. I've told everyone that I have been unavailable except for my customers. So like in the mornings I'll wake up and answer a bunch of emails, but everyone else, like I just, I don't have signal for, <laughs> they'll be disappointed when they hear this. Uh, but it's been, it's been amazing to slow down cause I haven't been able to do that in at least five months and just enjoy being outside. And just a reminder of like why you do stuff in the beginning to kind of paint a quick picture for the listener. It is late at night. We are sitting next to a beautiful bonfire surrounded by the silhouettes of these towering, gorgeous mountains and a blanket full of stars above us. I thought you were talking about us for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's so kind Slabs of you to describe me rock. like that. Yeah. Men. It's been, um, you know, Will, you kind of talked about this earlier too, like becoming whole again. I feel like me personally business has converted my personality from a very jovial, joking, almost avant-garde humor to, I feel like I still get like elements of that, but I feel like that no longer defines me. Like, I feel like I'm now a much more serious person, a much more like operated focus. And it's sad a little bit that, 
you know, everyone talks about the beauty of entrepreneurship and all the gifts that it brings. And it does bring so many gifts in, in terms of, you know, access to freedom and being around brilliant people. But it takes things away from, you know, it, it can be very lonely, like mm -hmm. especially you, you like you have no business partners. Mike, you don't have any business partners either. Mark and I are lucky that we have partners that help us along when it gets really dark. So, I, I mean, I think it's nice for these kind of events to remind yourself of maybe who you are and maybe it's still there or, or maybe there's a pathway to bring it back if you want to bring it back. Yeah, I, I think I've felt reconnected that to myself. I mean, you know, Justin McKenzie is here, one of my fraternity brothers from college, one of the people that's known me here the, the longest. And, you know, it's funny, I was thinking about some of the jokes we were cracking, some of the stories we were telling, some of the uh, inappropriate humor we were indulging in. And this is stuff that I haven't done in probably years. I mean, Mark, Mark you know me very well. You, I think you could probably attest that I think I'm a lot looser this week than I've been in a long time. That's a fair point. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I relate to that a lot. I think that when you're leading a company, every action is not only a reflection of you and then a reflection of the business, but it has an effect upon the people that work for you. And so you have to lead with an example that's uh, flawless, that's impeccable, especially, at least from a moral perspective. Obviously, you'll probably make business mistakes along the way. But, you know, it's a heavy weight at times. And so it's great to be along, I think, uh, Mike mentioned about peers and people who understand and have no judgment and can let you reconnect that part of yourself. Yeah. Mark, do you feel like you've lost a bit of your identity or self as you've? No, I think I've, I think mine has been a little opposite in the sense that I've, I feel like I've claimed myself a bit more. Like maybe I, I was putting on airs and I'm. Mark was pretending to be nice, but he's really a jackass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, we, we, yeah. we, we've heard about his explosive personality. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I, I think there were, there was a lot of, when I started, you know, first selling on Amazon in 20, I guess, 15, and then starting the 3PL Warehouse Republic in 2018, there was a lot of, this is what I think an entrepreneur should be versus learning like what an entrepreneur is and, you know, lots, a lot more of the less glamorous aspects of it. But what are those specifics? What did you think an entrepreneur should be? And then what are they to you? Well, I mean... You know, I guess when when I started, I I didn't understand like what like it's like how could you celebrate so many things that weren't actually like making a ton of money, you know? But you start celebrating different sorts of wins, like milestones, where it's like, oh, this month we lost fifty percent of what we did last month. Like you're seeing it go down and trend up towards break even and profitability. Like that's a you don't understand before you get in the game how exciting that can be and like how you're going to celebrate it or how important it becomes if, you know, you're team focused to really celebrate the wins of your in the developments of your team. For instance, I wouldn't have known beforehand just how much that would mean. And those are actually some of the bigger kind of milestones for me. You hit profitability and you're like, OK, that's great. It was expected. But, you know, somebody, a teammate who's maybe on the line makes a great decision that you didn't see it. You know, they wouldn't have made the month before. And you, and you see that as maybe even a bigger win because it's, I guess it's a little more unexpected. You're talking about like the growth of the business and kind of like achieving those successes. Do you ever feel like it's a never achieving goal in the sense that, you know, we hit profitability or we made this and now that's the new benchmark. So it never feels like an entrepreneurship. You've actually achieved anything, ironically, even though you're achieving so many things. Yeah. So I remember thinking if I can just get this sublease. And then it was, oh, if I could just get this building. And then if, if we can just get that first 50,000 square feet. And it just keeps on. You know, the goal line keeps moving. And I think there are some people out there who have kind of mastered themselves maybe a little bit more than I have who can say, I need to hit X and I'm happy and that's it. And they follow through with it. They do it like clockwork and then boom, they're out. I admire those people. I just don't think I am going to be ever one of those people. I think the goal line will always be moving for me. Well, it's funny because earlier this weekend, Mike, you were talking about your transition from your old business where you were trying to build towards the finish line. Right. And you've had a mental shift in that. Talk about that. For me, this is completely about building a platform where I can grow and enjoy the journey and I don't really care about the end. So every time someone buys something on MomentumShake.com, um, <laughs> I get a little uh, ka-ching sound on my Shopify app, and 
God, does that make me excited. Le- you know, especially the very first ones. And I would just like leave it on the phone and we're getting like 20 something orders a day. And I was just like this, this little rush of joy. I'd be like, oh, that's, that's great. And my sister was laughing at me because you know, I've made large businesses before. So this shouldn't matter like at this level. And I, and I just like kind of scolded her like, you let me enjoy this because this is going to last like six weeks. And then it'll be the new baseline. And then one day it'll be like, we only sold 200 orders today. This is terrible. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, you have to be aware of how your monkey mind kind of works. Mm-hmm. And uh, just be able to enjoy each step of it and be grateful for it. And because it'll go the other direction and just get used to it and get numb to it. I want to segue this conversation to a little bit different direction. We've got four brilliant minds of e-commerce here. And I want to talk about like, if all of our businesses were taken away from us and we had to start an e-commerce business, what would be the things that we would want in a business or how would we start to build it? So I'll get the party started with like, my vision would be like, you know, version take 2.0. I would try to build a company as lean as possible where I could be the solo owner and grow to, let's say like, I don't know, mid to upper six figures, maybe even seven figures if I'm lucky and super high margins a product that stands out in a way that i could create the product and create content around that so i've had people on the show like peachy babies or um, a mini katana who produce excellent content around their product and so that means like becoming a manufacturer of the product and i think that would be like a really interesting direction that i would take it to avoid all the headaches of you know like the sales tax and all these states and you know, like uh, just the the growth pains that come with like having ten team members, and I don't know where would you guys go. So, if I interpret correctly, the business goes away today and tomorrow. Yeah, so, yeah so you're we, building we, build your perfect ecom business. What's your perfect ecom business? So it's a little bit different for me. I mean, I'm in logistics uh, fulfillment, things like that, and. I've, I've gotten to a point where I'd be very, very valuable to a lot of large players just because of the way I understand the nitty gritty of the business. And I think what I'd probably do is I would actually probably go back to work for somebody for two to three years who's running an operation magnitudes more sophisticated than what we do, figure out those processes and then come back and raise a much larger amount of money at first to build a much more sophisticated warehouse at the start. So you'd go big, like you'd do the opposite of what I would do, which is like <laughs> safe and tiny and you go big. What What is that drive for going bigger? I want to be able to do more of these Zion trips <laughs> than I do now. I'm curious, Mike, I, you know, you're kind of doing that right now. What are the things that you designed this business around? Not to take over the, the No, no, you can take hosting. it. I mean, that's why we have four, <laughs> four brilliant people here. You know, did you think intentionally about that? And are you creating the thing that you, with all the different lessons from your previous companies? Yeah, there's still so much to learn, but I've been very intentional about this. I sold all the companies I had in 2019, and it was enough not to work again. And I just got so bored that I knew I had to go do something. So I just decided to kind of make rules for myself. And this thought exercise that we're doing is something I really was quite intentional about. And the things that I wanted to do differently was, one, I wanted to leverage my time in sales. So it had to be reoccurring. That's what I mean by that. The hardest thing in business to me is like getting the sale. So if you do it once, make sure that the customer is going to continue to want to work with you for a long, long time. So I think that was a really big mind shift for me. And then just really being passionate about the person that I am serving and the product that I'm making. And that has made such a huge shift in my mind from it being work to being play. Because the reason I knew I wanted to start with this was because I'd already put like 18 months into building this just for myself. I was just paying attention to my own attention. And like, what am I, no one has to force me to get up and like research all this stuff and work on it. Like, oh, maybe I should be doing this. It's a bit of a luxury, you know, like I did the exact opposite with the other businesses. I was completely market driven, paying attention more to what people wanted than what I wanted. And now I get to do a little bit of both. The thing, three years into this project, the thing I would do differently if I was starting over again would be to figure out how to bring on board an operator and a marketer in the capacity that we weren't partners because I have such a strong vision and uh, I'm a control freak, I think. Uh, (laughs) But so get people aligned with what I was doing 
wanting to follow without arguing, but like experts at what they were doing. And that might have just required, I don't know, raising a bunch of money or. It almost uh, sounds like a unicorn because what you're saying is you want someone who will follow and do as they're told, but maybe, kind of like uh, being able to execute on their own, right? Uh, and take that burden off of you. Right. To be able to execute and be better at what they're doing than I am, but on board with the vision. Yeah. I don't right. think anyone should ever work for your company who's not on board with your vision. Right. Ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like but, that would be the you, first red flag of hiring. When you work with partners, sometimes there is not alignment on the vision and not alignment on who's in charge and making that final decision, right? I think someone has to be the CEO and have designations of expertise. I would love to be able to fully hand off the things I'm terrible at. And it's, it's very clear where I'm not great, like logistics and things like that are, I can have do Have you them. met Mark Taylor? Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not good at those. I can do them. I'm competent, but that's where it feels like work. So I want to make sure I'm just doing the things that feel like joy to me. That's what I would change. What about you? Well, I mean, do you feel like Chisos is still that for you or like our shoes are really big and you got returns and stuff Cowboy like boots, yeah. my friend. Cowboy boots, okay. not shoes. <laughs> yeah. There's so much more than shoes. There's so much more. You know, so it's interesting. There's a a, a brilliant professor sitting in the audience here of you degenerates, go. Brandon Chikotsky down at TCU, and he's a, he's a phenomenal marketing professor. And he's uh, I'm joining him in a class this fall. We're actually tackling this exact question, which is how do you start a, a single proprietor e-commerce business in, in this day and age, what are the things you, you would consider? And so we've put together a list of like 26 principles. And a lot of those are learned from my experience with Chisos and the things that I would not necessarily consider mistakes, but just consider learnings. But there are things that I would change if I were to give recommendations to other people. And the thing out of those 26, there's some you're going to violate. So some of the ones that I violate are that we have, you know, skew, I would call it skew explosion. You know, like people think, oh, you only have like five boots for sale perhaps, but each boot represents 15 sizes, then it represents two widths, then it represents multiple colors. And so each boot actually represents 90 skews. So there's 450. When I look at that, I go, that's 450 products. Products, not five wow. because each unlike momentum shake which you've done one of the things that i would recommend people change is that everybody consumes the same skew we're yeah. gonna have vanilla no, no 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 you're not like listen to his advice you don't want to explode you would be doubling your skew count but but the thing that that you know i have often uh, i've worked in selling to oil and gas i've worked in large industrial manufacturing and these are all things that i honestly hated and my way of dealing with it was whenever i decided i wanted to quit i would just go to the gym and then you know i was going to the gym once a week and then eventually twice a day and <laughs> and you were so strong I was, I was i was jacked at that point in my life but so what I optimize for with this is I simply wanted, um, I guess I think that it's like, it's a journey. It's like you get to this point. And one thing I want to mention for people listening is that you rarely get to go straight to this point that Mike's at or even that I'm at and I'm chasing Mike on your first go around, yeah. right? You have to eat shit at some point. We all do. This is part of the process no matter what. And in that, you know, like some of the stuff that Mark's doing, I wouldn't want to do. And I think probably vice versa. And so, you know, but what I've learned with mine is that I wanted the brand to be the company to be in, in line with how I want to live my life anyway. Mm. So we're at, we're sitting here at this retreat with a bunch of great guys. And I mean, I hasn't even called it a retreat. It's just a badass camping trip. And this is what I do with my team at Chisos, right? We go out literally to the Chisos Mountains in Big Bend National Park and I take it out there and I cook for them. And like, well, this is what we do and we get to call it work. And we create content as part of it. Uh, we just live our lives. And the product is something that I enjoy and I think there's a lot of uh, character and value behind the people that are drawn to it as well. And so I get to imbibe my values into the business as opposed to living this dual life. And some people don't need that or don't have the same dual or their values are, you know, uh, more of a logistical nature, perhaps. But the <laughs> well, I think there's like reality where like this is the only opportunity you have because you don't have the resources that Mike has to to give it three years to develop. It's like I need to make money right now to put food on the table for my family. Yeah, I think there's that, and I think that I will fully admit that by the time Chisos rolled around, 
you know, there was some breathing room I had in my personal life. It's it's one of those things kind of like, you know, when you're uh, an old analogy is like if you're starving and someone throws you an apple, you eat the apple. If they throw you an orange, you eat the orange. But once you're full, you go, well, maybe I want a damn steak. Yeah. You know, you start thinking around and you try different things and then you really you start to assemble that scenario. And so is she says the end all be all. I think for me, there's some violations that I would say about like skews and things of that nature. But the core thing for me was that do I want to do this for the next 10 or 20 years? And the answer was yes. Now, Mark, were you drawn to fulfillment? Is that like a real passion of yours? Or how do you get like, I, I like, don't understand this kind of like, what is it? It, it seems like a personality right match. Like, it <laughs> seems like the yeah. organization. Uh, so when I started, it was with the FBA company and, you know, that we launched. And one thing I would encourage all your listeners, if you're, you know, really having to struggle to figure out how to fund your business, do everything you can to identify small, cheap experiments that fail very fast. <laughs> How cheap is cheap? Uh, you know, $5,000 or less. Okay. Yeah. So we were doing this, the, the product business, and I really enjoyed sourcing the manufacturer, interviewing them, working the specs with them, working with a freight forwarder, then getting it in. And I, I really enjoyed the logistical aspect of it, and that became kind of what I would do in the business the most. And my partner at the time was very good at building up Facebook audiences and things like that. And that was the stuff where I was just like, okay, this is voodoo. I don't really <laughs> get it. I, I, I don't like the visceral. It's like, okay, well, we want to get, you know, when you're speaking in percentages, it's like, well, our average cost of sale or our A cost is 39% last week and now it's 25%. And I, he would get excited about that. And I'm just like, eyes glazed over. I'm like, yeah, I, I can't see behind exactly how it's doing. And you say it's an algorithm, but I don't believe it. But what I do believe is when a box shows up and one way or another, it's leaving that warehouse, unless the warehouse burns, of course. But, you know, it's either walking out in a fulfillment order or somebody steals it or which is not common, but it's going to move or it's somewhere in the warehouse. So it's like that visceral nature really I connect with. I like being able to see it, feel it, touch it. And so, yeah, I would say, you know, to Will's point, do I want to do this for the next 10 to 20 years? And I can't imagine not doing it for, you know, any amount. I mean, it's just it's just what I see myself doing. Well, one thing that kind of just dawned on me is, are you even asking that question, right? And so not everyone has to ask that question. You know, I mean, like some people are like, I want to build this for three years and I want to flip it. And they're looking at that from the beginning. But I think one of the things about, you know, where we are at our stations in life is that we're kind of looking for more of, I hesitate to use the word vocation, but something that has more fulfillment, uh -huh, more meaning <laughs> to, to, to each of us. That was an accident. <laughs> And I think that that's what you get to do when you're starting to approach midlife, right? You know, this is kind of the evolution. And I look around the table here of the of the men that are on this trip to begin with, is that there's things that you do in your adolescent years, your early 20s. And then when you hit 30, this is me, you know, a little bit of unsolicited advice to people who, who might be younger. When you hit around 30, you have to finally decide what you're going to do. You know, you can mess around in your 20s, but by the time you hit 30, it takes about 10 years to develop expertise in an area. And then you get to graduate to being a, you know, a established adult, so to speak. You know, this you see this in the medical field, you see this in law, you see if you want to become partner, all these type of things. And so one of the things that I've seen with the, the four of us sitting here and the rest of the guys of this group is that we've all kind of put in our time, whether that was at full employment or at smaller businesses. And so now even these conversations of us getting to decide, what do I want to do for the next season of life? is a very rare thing that I think people even be able to get to sit back or even think about. It's not just what you want to do. The question gets to evolve into why you want to do it yes. at all. And that's the thing that has changed in this new adventure for me is like, it's completely about why I want to do something. And every time I run into something, like I'm not enjoying the process of doing it. I go back to, is this why I started this? No, I'm just not going to do it. So it either, either gets outsourced or it doesn't get done. And I just start challenging these beliefs. Like I'm supposed to be tweeting every day and I'm supposed to be creating content. And I don't do any of that because I don't like doing it. I'm not I'm like, Eric, you're a wizard at that. And you clearly enjoy doing it. And I, I don't have that. So I was like, well, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> Maybe I'll hire someone I mean, someone I do eventually. the same thing. There's a lot of things that I don't do probably. Yeah. I think that's just an awesome place to be. You get to decide why you're going to do something. The business is here to help other people and connect with other people, but it's also here to bring joy and meaning into our lives, right? I think for me, my why actually enables me to do a lot of things I don't want to do. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so for me, I want to, and I don't usually share this, but 
hey, why not? I think the thing for me is that I'm looking forward, right? Uh, I'm not married. I haven't had kids yet. And I'm a little late to the game. And part of that, though, for me is that I want to, you know, all due respect to my dad and, and what the things that he gave us. But, like, he wasn't there. He was always working. And um, there were different insecurities that happened and different things. And so I've worked really hard to be able to create a business that reflects the values that I have, which enabled me to be there in the future. So I want my kids to not have to worry about money. I want them to be able to have the best environment to grow up in. I want them to be in an elevated status of society than I was in. And I want to be able to be there to lead them and enjoy that with them. And so, you know, I love your question of the why. And everyone has different ones. And so for me, that's the thing. And so that question comes up to me. And times there's things I don't enjoy, but are they going to push me towards that goal? And then the second thing is that it kind of keeps my ego in check because do I want to go bigger in certain directions? And what are the sacrifices I'm going to make for that? And is it really worth the trade off? It's really, really interesting hanging out with all of you guys and kind of seeing the whys come out as like we, we, so we hiked Angel's Landing yesterday, which has a, a pretty steep vertical at the end. And Eric crushed everybody. He got to the top. I think he took an elevator. It was so much faster than the rest of us. And I came up with the very rear at like the last 15. I, I was helping, you know, some stragglers. But we just took our time and like really enjoyed the slow pace of everything and stopped and took pictures. And Eric just didn't want to stop. And like, I think Will wanted to keep going long after everybody else. He's like, well, let's do another hike. And it's everyone's personality and motivations was Thanks, so Mark, for joining clearly, me on that extra hike, by the way. Clearly different, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's cool that those strategies can exemplify and we can all enjoy them. Like none of them are right. I was curious how much of your brain energy goes to your business currently and maybe at its peak or when you started? We'll go around a circle. When I started, 99%. If you're awake, you're thinking about the business. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think, I think this is part of the thing, when I, going back to what I mentioned earlier about becoming a human again, is that all of my... You know, again, I'm not married. I don't have kids, so I haven't had that ability. I moved to another country to learn the process. You know, before this, my last business was, you know, a thousand miles a year on an airplane, you know, so every waking moment of the energy was devoted to it. And it's difficult for me to pull that back, but I realized that I need to pull it back for my health. And I need to pull it back so that I have that muscle again, I have that practice and I have that space for other people and other things to come into my life. So how much do you feel it is now? I don't know if I'm being honest, it's probably like... 89%. <laughs> I know, like I get it, you know. Mark, you? Very similar. You know, when we started, I was living in the warehouse on an air mattress. So I don't even... I, mean, I remember I, that, man. You were yeah. a beast. I, 100% uh, of the time, was I thinking about the warehouse then. And I, and I think, I think, outside of this trip, which is, you know, part of why this trip is nice is because I've had to focus on other things, helping, you know, get things set up or finding firewood, whatever it may be. I'm not gathering because that would be illegal in a <laughs> national park. <laughs> For the record. For the record. But now, I mean, here, it's, it's a nice disconnect. But when I go back, I mean, it's it's still 93% of the time, yeah. Well, you have a podcast too, right? Yeah, it gets 2% of my effort. Yeah, so what's the podcast? <laughs> uh, supply Chain Saga. It's supply, a chain supply Saga. Ch yeah, Supply Chain, all aspects of it. And what about you, Mike? I mean... For years, it was obviously zero. And even when I was running the business, it was like 5%. And it really gave me a crisis of meaning. And so for the last year and a half, it has been, you know, 95% of my thoughts are about it. But I really like it, you know. To me, it's this is the highest level of chess that you can play. You are constantly figuring out problem solving. It is just one giant Rubik's Cube that moves and... I don't know. I like I wake up and I start working on stuff because I had an idea. And then I go on a walk and then I hop in the shower and I'm like, oh my god, that would be great. I should write a jingle for this. And then just, it just continues to evolve. So it's nice to be able to take a break from that because it can be a uh, I don't know obsessive or addicting to like always have something to work on, which is fun, but it's also you know we're complex organisms. Our personalities are multifaceted, and this weekend was kind of a reminder of that all of us i think are the face of our brands and a brand Nobody knows who mark is <laughs> <laughs> well, you... and that's his brand yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for the for the three of us we are face forward on our brands and our brands have a message and you know we want to be taken seriously so we present that and listeners if you could have heard the ridiculousness the amount of laughter that has happened for me it was just a reminder that i'm not always this hyper eloquent 
intellectual, humble person you're hearing right now. This is the first I've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> this is that was a joke. Um, I'm usually was a joke. quite sarcastic and fun, and it's just kind of good to tap into that other side of me again. I, I have to figure out how to incorporate that into a brand so I can be fully rounded again. I would share the the same thing. If I was awake, I was thinking about beard brand, and probably for the first I don't know three or four years, and then eventually. It was always a struggle because I had, you know, a wife and kids and the guilt that came along with like all my brain energy going to this business, trying to make it survive and thrive and grow and the the guilt of being a dad. And like, am I neglecting my kids by, you know, like just these thoughts are not thinking about like, what kind of vitamins do I give her and things like that? You know, 11 years in, that's certainly changed to, to the point where it's, you know, probably, I don't know, half and half or 70, 30 split. So more time has opened up to that. But I want to wrap it up and saying like, if you found this conversation valuable and I wanted to kind of share the experience that we had all weekend at the retreat. And I want to encourage anyone who is an operator to do what Mark and Will did and just commit to it. You will find people, you'll ask people, you'll make it happen. And as everyone has said here, like the events that you are able to share meaningful time with people where you're present with them without distractions and have these shared experiences will completely fundamentally change your life in a way that will only be positive. So um, one last call out. Where do you buy your products? Where do you support you guys? Uh, MomentumShake.com. It is an all-in-one longevity shake that is the most premium thing on the market. I guarantee it. Uh, Warehouse Republic, and that would be at warehouserepublic.com or Supply Chain Saga is the name of the podcast. It's on all the major podcast places. Yeah, we're a third-party logistics company, very customer-centric. Anybody who has ever needed to get a hold of me can still get a hold of me on my phone. Who's a customer, that is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I make damn comfortable cowboy boots. You can find them at chisos.com, C-H-I-S-O-S.com. Great, guys. This has been another e-commerce conversations. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Cheers, and keep on growing. <laughs> <laughs>